worship by John Bauer. Live each new day. I want my life to say how I love you, my Lord, and I long to praise your name. I want my life to be. Like I sing this song, bringing glory to your name. Oh, powerful and strong, may my life be my worship, my life be my song. May I praise you, my Savior, all the day long. From the sun in its rising to the night when it falls, may my life be my worship, my life be my song. As I live each new day, I want my life to say how I love you, my Lord, and long to praise your name. I want my life to be. Just like I sing this song, bring glory to your name, O oh, powerful and strong, may my life be my worship, my life be my song, may I praise you, my Savior, all the day long. From the sun in its rising to the night when it falls, may my life be my worship, my life be my song. Oh, may my life be my worship, my life be my song. Praise you, my Savior, all the day long. From the sun in its rising to the night when it falls, may my life be my worship, my life be my song. May my life be my worship. My life be my song. Thank you, Mark and Krista. Our scripture reading this morning is a scripture reading that um, well, it's good. <laughs> it's a story that happens to Jesus. It's a story that happens to each one of us when it comes to filling out tax papers. It's a story that comes each time that we pay for gas and we see the amount of taxes we pay. It's every time that you think about that three-letter word, tax. And so Jesus 
comes and is accosted by the Pharisees and the Herodians. And we're going to ask Guido to read the story to us from um, Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. And, And I invite you to stand as we hear the reading of the gospel. The Holy Word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians and saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. So far the reading. It is said that there are two things in life that one cannot avoid. One is death, and the other is taxes. I would like to propose to you this morning that there's probably only one thing in life we can't avoid, and that's taxes. You can avoid death by believing in Jesus, who takes away death and makes us live for everlasting. However, the story is, is an old one, isn't it? I mean, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of taxes... Uh, People have been trying to avoid and evade, uh, paying whatever it is that they needed to. And our story really begins way back in the chapter before, in verses 23 of chapter 21, where Jesus is being asked by the leadership, so what authority do you have about teaching and healing people? I mean, where do you get this from? And so Jesus has taught three um, parables, the two sons, the vineyard, and the great banquet. And so they, they pull back a bit, these Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians, and they pull back a bit and they begin to wander and they begin to talk amongst themselves. And the, the Sadducees are apart, but the Pharisees say to the Herodians, come here a minute, come here. And the two parts get together and they begin to plot on how we can catch Jesus in his own words. And so here's the trap. It's a good one. It's excellent. Because on the one hand, you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees are these people who, who are um, upright in their, in their way of life. They, they have their standards. And then you have the Herodians who are totally opposite. The Pharisees love the Jewish nation. The Pharisees are are in love with God and and with the temple and with Jerusalem and it profits if they have to put up with them. But, you know, they love to tithe. They love to do things right. They love to pray out loud so everybody can hear them. Uh, The Herodians are on the other end. The Herodians love Herod. They're they're Herod's party. And as they get together, um, they, they like Rome They put up with the Jewish stuff, uh, but they wish that Rome had a more powerful influence uh, both physically, spiritually, and mentally on the people of God. And so you've got these two. You've got the left and you've got the right. And you begin to wonder how in the world that these two parties can come together. But that's how you set the trap. The trap is this. Let's catch him on taxes. Because the Pharisees would say, of course you don't pay taxes. 
The Pharisees, all that we are, all that we have, all that belongs to us, really belongs to God. The Herodians would say, no, 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 everything, first of all, belongs to Herod and therefore to the emperor. You have the spiritual versus the worldly. It's a great trap. Because if Jesus says to the question that they're about to ask him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And you say, on the one hand, you stand with the Pharisees and you say, no, because everything in this nation belongs to God. You're in trouble with the emperor. If on the other hand, you say, no, everything in this nation, um, truly, I'm sorry, yeah, belongs to Herod, then what's happening is that Herod is going to say, but you're, you're not being true to your faith. And so there's really no way out. What's Jesus going to say? Is he going to say yes to taxes? Is he going to say no to taxes? What is it? But Jesus sees them coming, right? And he hears their question, is it right to pay taxes? But notice what they're trying to do. They're trying to, um, to catch him with his own words. So what do you do first? Well, you butter a guy up. Don't you? We know, Lord, that you are sincere. You teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Gag. Oh, sorry. You teach the way of truth. You show deference to nobody. We wish you'd stand with us a bit more. But, and you don't regard anybody partially. So in other words, you want, you're not going to tell the difference between the Herodians. You're not going to tell the difference between the Pharisees. And it must have made them sick to come to Jesus and butter up with him with words that they never meant to say. They never really meant from their hearts. But they butter him up. So Lord, gee, teacher, is it right then to pay taxes? Well, let me tell you why we pay taxes. Or why anybody pays taxes. Taxes are so that people uh, can have a government. We pay taxes so that there's an administration that is set above us, some kind of leadership, that there are roads in which we can travel, so that there's a defense against enemies and protection against criminals. We have a government for good reason. This is Caesar's business. That's what he was meant to be. That's what he was meant to do. But Jesus gives an implication in the answer that he gives that there's more to it than that. Caesar's belongs to Caesar's, but God belongs to God's, so we are to give to God as well. And what are we supposed to give to God? So Jesus says, neither yes or no. He asks them a question. And he says, can you give me a denarii or a denarius, which is sort of like a nickel or a dime or a quarter, really a penny. But. And if you take a look at the front of your bulletin, you'll see a picture of denarius, a Roman denarius. And Jesus says, whose picture is on there? Well, Caesar's, of course. Whose picture's on our money? Queen Elizabeth II. Or if you've got some old money, King George. Right? And so we've got, we've got the same thing. And to have your picture stamped on something means that unless you really take something hard and rub the picture off, which then makes the money valueless, it just makes it a piece of silver, With a picture on that, it means that this now really belongs to me. Whenever somebody gives me a book or I buy a book, the first thing that I do is I put my name in there, AMB, underline it, and then I put in there the year and the month that I received or bought the book. It's my book. 
and mine to do with whatever I please. And it's the same, tr the same thing is true for each one of us. When we belong to the kingdom of Jesus, we belong to him. And because we belong to him, we have his image stamped on him. In fact, literally, we have that image stamped on him because of Genesis. In the beginning, God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In other words, the stamp is perfect. God made it. And he stamped it on Adam and on Eve. And even though sin has spoiled that image, through our sinful state, we are, and through our sinful state, we are unable to, to clearly show what that image looks like. Through Jesus Christ, we are daily being restored to the image that God has perfected within us. In other words, we belong to God. Therefore, give your money to taxes, but you yourself belong to God. Ephesians 4.24 says, Clothe yourself with the new self, created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, the clothing of righteousness, which we talked about last week, the clothing of righteousness, which is really the wedding gown, or the wedding clothing, when God puts that on us, we reflect his righteousness, we reflect his holiness, uh, we reflect his image. Colossians 3 verse 10 says, You have clothed yourself with a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator. In other words, you and I bear the image of God inside of us which the world ought to be able to see and celebrate. You and I are so different from those who just simply pay taxes. We are so different from those who hold a passport to earth instead of a passport to the place where Jesus is. Do you get that? In other words, the writer of the song, This World Is Not My Home, has got it absolutely right. And yet so often we make it our place, our home. But also in this answer, Jesus is saying that we have responsibility to both. Both to Caesar and to the Christian, uh, to Christian uh, kingdom. In other words, as D.L. Moody says, a Christian should not be so heavenly minded that he is no earthly good. In other words, God put us to work here. So we have a dual citizenship, you and I. A dual citizenship with a dual responsibility. We belong to this earth. We belong to this, nation's, uh, this nation. We have a passport that says we are Canadian, or we have a work permit that says we belong in Canada. But by the grace of God and through the blood of Christ, you and I, are then also members of the kingdom of Jesus. So what is our responsibility then to this planet, to us, uh, to this world in which we live, to our governments? Peter and Paul both write the very same thing, at least have the very same theme, that to the early church, that they ought to be obedient to Caesar. We read that in the way to life. Honor the king, it says. In the newer translations, honor Caesar. In other words, we are called on to honor those who have been called into leadership. Listen to Romans 3. If you've got your fingers uh, open in the Bible somewhere. Romans 13, I'm sorry. Romans 13, verse 1. Hear these words. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 
For there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror for good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you pay taxes. Don't you love this one, huh? For the same reason, you pay taxes, for they are authorities. These authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes is due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. I don't know what you do when you get your, is it T4 slips? I don't know what you do when you fill out your income taxes. But I know what's right. And I know what the scriptures desire that we do. That we have responsibility here on earth towards the government who holds authority over us by God's grace. In our way to life earlier, Peter said the same thing. I have a long reading, but I'd like you to read it with me. It'll be up on the screen. And this reading comes from the Belgic Confession, Article 37. And it again explains the Reformed view of what it means to be a person who lives on this planet. Let's say it together. We believe that because of the depravity of the human race, our good God has ordained kings, princes, and civil officers. God wants the world to be governed by laws and uh, policies so that human lawlessness may be restrained and that everything may be conducted in good order among human beings. For that purpose, God has placed the sword in the hands of the government to punish evil people, and to protect the good. And being called in this manner to contribute the advancement of a society that is pleasing to God, the civil rulers have a task, subject to God's law, of removing every obstacle to the preaching of the gospel and to every aspect of divine worship. They should do this while completely refraining from the tendency toward exercising authority and while functioning in the sphere entrusted to them with no mean they should do it in order that the word of God may have free course the kingdom of Jesus may have progress and every anti-Christian power may be resisted moreover everyone regardless of status condition or rank must be subject to the government and pay taxes and hold its representative in honor and respect and obey them in all things and are not in conflict with God's word, praying for them that the Lord will be willing to lead them in all their ways and that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all piety and decency. Amazing, isn't it? If I could just read it. Uh, but it's amazing, isn't it? This was written way back in the, 15th, the 16th century. And it reminds us of the fact that what the Bible says is our responsibility to pray for those who have leadership over you, to constantly pray for them so that they may not impede the word of God from going forth. Notice that that is the real essence that it's God who is in control. It is God word, God's word that truly rules. 
So in a world that's gone wrong then, in a world where there is so much anti-Christian feeling, what do we do? We pray for our leadership and we pay our taxes. Finally, Jesus says there are things that belong to him uh, and that we ought to offer to him alone. Uh, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all that is in them, the the world and all that who live in it. A simple statement saying that everything simply belongs to God. Everything. More clearly, we belong to God, as we said earlier. Romans 12, 1, I appeal you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, to worship God as we are commanded, we do so with our heart and soul and mind and strength. We do it with everything that we are and everything that we have, everything that we ever hope to be, every dream, every, every desire. The stuff you have, the stuff that we like to cling to so deeply doesn't belong to us. I remember when my mother moved from the house that she lived in and had to go into a small place in a a nursing care center. I remember, remember my sister saying how difficult it was for mom because she had all this stuff. What do I do with this? Where does it go? Who does it belong to? I hear it from families. I've done it with Mrs. Peterson, my friend, when she moved from her condo into uh, Shalom Manor. And I said to her, what do I do with all your stuff? She was gracious. She said, whatever you want. (laughs) Because she knew that she couldn't put it all in there. But we get so attached to our world. We get so attached to our things. And yet there's not one thing that you think you own that you own. Nothing is ours. We can claim no ownership over it. Not even our children. It all belongs to God. So when these two groups, one on the left and one on the right, comes to Jesus and say, is it right for us to pay taxes? They expected him to fall into a trap that he refused to fall into. And he said, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You give to God what is God's. And then the last verse was, and they were amazed by his teaching. In fact, they were so amazed, they just sort of shook their heads and walked away. They were amazed. You and I may not be Solomon, but we are God's kids. And we ought to be amazed at the words of Jesus, who always leads us in the right path, in order that we might serve both God and country. All for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord.